thank you for joining me, Lara Kui, for the Legal Genie podcast. As a former corporate lawyer and APAC head of business development for an international law firm, my mission with this podcast is to provide you with insights into the careers and lives of movers and shakers in the legal industry. Mentors are hard to come by, so by listening to these conversations, I hope that you will gain some valuable insights that will help you move forward in your career and personal life. I ask my guests to share their advice and experience with you. I ask them also to share about their mindset. As an executive coach, I work one-on-one with lawyers to grow their practice and self-confidence. I also run mastermind groups and business development accelerators designed to bring like-minded people together to learn, grow and support each other. If you would like to learn more, please connect with me on LinkedIn or through my website. The details are in the show notes. Please rate and review the Legal Genie podcast to help us reach more people who may find it helpful. So let's move on to this week's episode. I hope that you enjoy the conversation. Hello and welcome to episode 17 of the Legal Genie podcast with me, your host, Lara Kui. This week, I'm excited to be in conversation with William McLaughlin. William is a legal business developer and marketer based in Bangkok, Thailand. He specializes in improving back-end legal operations and helping lawyers with the business of law. William is currently the business development manager at Zico Law, a regional law firm operating in all 10 ASEAN countries. He is responsible for the firm's business development operations in Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Vietnam, and Thailand, where he helps develop regional strategies to further drive client growth across Southeast Asia. William also runs the BD Roundtable, a global community of legal business developers and marketers. The community brings people together to share tried and tested resources, tools, and know-how through virtual roundtable sessions. William is originally from Pennsylvania in the United States and has been working in Bangkok since 2010. He previously worked at Baker and McKenzie and other consultancies before joining Zico Law. Hello, Will. It's great to have you on the show. Hi, thanks for having me. It's uh, great to be here. Well, it's certainly fun to turn the tables on you since last time you were the one interviewing me for the BD Roundtable. So let's start with a little bit about your background and where you grew up. Yeah, so I'm originally from Pennsylvania. For those who don't know, it's on the east coast of the United States. And I grew up hiking and camping and rock climbing, sort of outdoors life. And now here I am. I found myself in Bangkok, Thailand, in a big metropolis. So it's quite out of my normal routine. But yeah, so I grew up there and did lots of uh, outdoors activities and never thought I would be working in a big city. But yet here I am. Tell us a little bit about what you chose to study at university and why. Yeah, so I always had a CNN on the background growing up, and my father always watched CNN and MSNBC, so I was always very interested in politics. So when it came time to decide what am I going to do at university, I kind of gravitated toward political science. So I did a bachelor's in political science, and I sort of focused on international political economy because I was always quite interested in how the economy impacts politics and how politics impacts the economy. And you can't really understand one without the other. So that's what I did my undergrad in. And in that degree, I studied a lot about Southeast Asia, you know, the 1997 financial crisis, Tom Yong-gun crisis. And that's kind of how my worldview opened up into Southeast Asia. And that kind of primed me to come here once I got my first job. That's interesting about the interest in politics and international relations, etc. So you did actually start off your career being a regulatory assistant, doing all sorts of research. And it looks like quite a few of the positions you've had has involved research. So is that something you really enjoy? No, I hated it. It was just one of those things because I knew I wasn't going to work in the UN or anything like that. And after graduating, I was working in local government doing bill analysis because that's just the job that opened up to me. And I was there sitting in my little cubicle in the, the Capitol building in Pennsylvania. And I had a flash forward of my life 40 years from now. I was like, 
am I going to be doing the same thing? This is not what I want to do. And that was sort of my existential crisis moment. And I was like, okay, I'm 25. It was 2009 at the time. So that whole financial crisis in the U.S. I was like, I need to get as far away from the U.S. as I can. So I did what most 25-year-olds did as I traveled all the way around the world to the opposite side of the globe, pretty much, and traveled to Southeast Asia to just get away from the U.S. I didn't really have much of a goal in mind, but yeah, I traveled around Southeast Asia and I liked Thailand the best. And I did what most foreigners do here in Bangkok. I did a little stint teaching English until a real job came along. And that happened to be working at Baker McKenzie in the legal industry. So no plans of working in the legal industry. I just kind of fell into it. That's interesting. So nobody in your family, any contacts who had legal? No, none at all. Okay. The only, yeah, the only experience I had to the legal industry is what I saw on TV. So I thought all law firms were like litigation firms. I didn't really understand what a corporate law firm was. So yes, it was very unexpected. And I just kind of jumped into it. You've actually been in Thailand more than 10 years now. So when you first arrived, what were your impressions being an American in Thailand? What cultural differences did you notice? Well, I was expecting more of a culture shock, actually. But I didn't go to China. I didn't go to Korea or Japan, which is very homogenous. I landed in Bangkok, which is a very open city. People are so friendly. There wasn't much culture issues or culture shock, except for the heat. (laughs) <laughs> but that's not really a culture shock. So I did quite well. And I traveled around the region and Bangkok the best. Singapore is a bit too clean for me. And some of the other countries were a bit too messy. But I, I like Thailand was a good middle ground for me. But I would say on the culture side, punctuality was always an issue. The Southeast Asian cultures tend to be a bit lax in that. So that was something to be adjusted to. And I was always complaining about, why don't they do things like this? Why don't they do things like this? It should be done like this. And after 10 years, I've kind of just learned to live with the flow. And I'm not going to change a culture single-handedly, so I might as well adapt to it. So I think after 11 years, I adapted to the Thai culture. A bit. Do you speak any Thai? I do. I'm intermediate. I can't speak good business Thai, but everyday Thai, I can open up a bank account and do all that in full Thai. So I'm pretty good there. My wife is Thai, so that helps a bit too as well. Well, definitely you've integrated yourself into the culture and learned the language and that's fantastic. So tell me a bit about your role at Zico Law and and the kind of work that you do on a daily basis. Yeah, so our business development team is fairly small. So that means I do pretty much everything that the lawyers don't want to do or can't do. So that's everything from business development, marketing, website development, event management, submissions, proposals, sort of a a jack of all trades in the business development field. I have a purview of Cambodia, Lao, Myanmar, Vietnam, and Thailand, so the Mekong region. So I'm doing a lot of strategic work there, helping the lawyers find new clients and building the the relationships in that region. It's a very wide remit because I know that you've actually got 18 offices under your belt. So how do you actually manage to service all of them all the time? It must be very challenging. Yeah, well, when I was at Baker's, I was only just managing the Thailand office and I thought that was uh, a big load. So I started using a program called Asana, which is just a project management tool. It's kind of like a to-do list or, you know, all those sort of things out there. But I found that to be the best. And I started that at Baker's. And then that really helped me sort of prioritize and figure out what I'm going to do today, what I'm going to do this week, and what are sort of my long-term goals. And then when I moved to Zico, I had that times five, right? That workload times five with all the other countries. And it became very, very unsustainable doing the whole to-do list via email. So I really doubled down on using Asana and a project management system. I just started using that myself. And then the rest of the BD team sort of implemented that just out of necessity as well, because they saw um, how useful it could be. So certainly project management system, whatever it may be, whatever's comfortable for you and your firm, but that's been the, the lifesaver. And in terms of dealing with the lawyers, what challenges have you seen? Well, we had a session uh, with you about the lawyer personality traits and just learning 
how each lawyer is a bit different. So managing uh, expectations and just working toward each lawyer's proclivities and how they like to manage their things. So that's the biggest challenge is just working with the lawyers on an individual basis and building that relationship. And also, I would say change management, because that's always a big issue. And the BD teams sort of know how things should be done and know the best practices. But a lot of times, lawyers kind of just like to do things how they've always been done and trying to find ways to get them to come around to the, the other side of things and start doing things a bit differently. So that's sort of an ongoing challenge, but not impossible. And what are the main aspects of your role that you enjoy the most? I would say the biggest advantage of working at Zico is I have a hand in almost everything, which is great. Some people who I know in the BD Roundtable community, they work in these very big law firms and they're only focused on pitches. They do pitches day in and day out, where I really enjoy having the breadth of experience and doing lots of different things. So every day is quite different. So I don't have the Sunday blues thinking about, oh, Monday morning. I'm more like, oh, all right, let's jump on this task on Monday and then Tuesday we'll do this and then Wednesday we'll do that. So everything is a bit varied, which is a very useful. And thinking about younger people or somebody who might be interested in joining business development as a career for them, what kind of advice have you got for younger people? In the legal industry? Yes. Well, I would say try to focus all of your tasks to be more proactive. Because when you first start in a law firm, the very first thing you're going to do is say yes to everything. So it very quickly turns into a reactive sort of role. You're doing this because the partner asked you to do it. And then you wait for stuff to come in. You're not really focused on sort of the long-term initiatives. But that's dependent on the firm, obviously. But really... For new legal BD marketers, business developers, try and be as proactive as you can to bring value to the partnership and to the firm. So that would be one. The second piece of advice is try to profile yourself outside of your firm. Try to do something that's not just your firm. Uh, Do create a community or do something where you can profile yourself because you're not always going to be at that firm. So you want to build your professional profile online and create sort of a, you know, an awareness of who you are and build that reputation and build that network that's not just dependent on where you happen to work at the moment. So proactivity, bring value to your partnership, and then while you're doing that, build your professional profile online. Well, that's a great segue into your own community at the BD Roundtable. So tell us a little bit more about why you started that and what you're doing with it now. Yeah, well, that goes back to my very first week working at Baker's. So like I said, I jumped into the legal industry, knew nothing. So one of the first things I did was I went online to try and find a community, legal marketers, a community. And I found two types of groups. There was the very big formal official association type group, and that required lots of fees. And I didn't have the money to pay those membership fees. And a lot of the content on those associations were very high level. I needed like checklists and guides and like, okay, step by step, how to do a submission sort of thing. And I wasn't finding that on those sort of communities. And then I jumped over to the social media type groups with the Facebook and LinkedIn, but those were just full of the same consultants recycling the same blog post again and again, just in different words. And again, I really couldn't find that community connection. So I did what I should have done is I reached out to my peers in other law firms in Bangkok and organized a a monthly dinner. And that just became known as the BD Dinner, the BD Group in Bangkok. We had a very uh, casual chit chat, complaining about partners, complaining about submissions and all of that. And throughout those uh, dinners, that's where I learned how to do all of this. Oh, you guys do it this way. Oh, I never thought about that. Let me try to do that in my firm. And we did that for years. And we always said, wouldn't it be nice to have this sort of community at a wider level to learn from other people? And after years of saying, wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice? I ended up just uh, building the BD Roundtable website over one weekend when I was bored and the community. And that happened 
a month before COVID really hit. So it was kind of fortuitous because now people are a bit primed to be getting on these Zoom calls and doing these virtual roundtable sessions. So it ended up being a benefit to when people were working from home. So now we have a, a fairly decent sized community of legal marketers and legal business developers across 40 plus countries. It's a fantastic platform. Anyone should go there because a membership is free. And once you're in there and registered, you can join a Slack group. You can look at all of the videos that are there. You can watch them you know, in your own time and you can learn so much. I think the community that you've created and also the resources and the people all willing to share their knowledge is fantastic. And I know that you're even doing multilingual versions. You've got people delivering talks in Spanish and probably other languages as well. And so if people are getting on board and volunteering and coming up with ideas as well, aren't they? Yeah. And when I started, it was kind of like a one man show. So I would be doing all these interviews. I was doing one interview a week and it became really unsustainable. And that's not what I wanted the Beauty Roundtable to be. I wanted it just to be a platform where we can share good content that's actionable and practical and you can download a checklist and you can take notes when you're watching these sessions. And that's what I hope it's become. So to make it more accessible to everyone, I started bringing in hosts from around the world. So we have a fantastic uh, host in, in London, Simon Marshall, who takes care of that time zone. I sort of do the Southeast Asian time zone. We have coming up on eight hosts now. And we've just started in Latin America. So we're doing sessions in Spanish. We have sessions in Portuguese coming up, in German. So hopefully we're giving good content to people for free. None of this $500 membership or anything like that. So it, and it's a way for me, it's kind of a bit selfish, right? It's a way for me to learn more about the legal industry because I get to invite experts who know far more than I do and ask them questions and I become better off. So that was sort of the press, you know, why I started it. And then it just became valuable for other people and people seem to like it. And now, I don't know if you've seen, but we started a, a petition to standardize legal directory submissions. So hopefully we're making a, a positive change in the, the legal industry through some of our initiatives. I do know what you mean. The legal directory submissions are definitely the bane of the lives of all business development and marketing teams. Lots of the big firms can have dedicated people. And I know that many firms do outsource that. There are professionals who just do directory submissions. But if you're a very lean team and you're doing that, but you're also trying to do pitches and proposals and all sorts of other things and all of the numerous tasks involved in business development, it is very difficult. And there was even the um, online version where you had to go into their platform and every single question you had to type. But the reality is that as business development, you actually don't know all those answers. So it is not feasible to be able to do it online in that way. You have to be able to have your own document that you can upload and amend, etc. So I do believe that the standardization is important. But also the thing that used to worry me most was in relation to the referees, because it is not possible to be asking these very busy in-house counsel for references and to be approached by all of these directories several times. If you imagine how many lawyers they work with, they could literally be bombarded by thousands of the requests. And this is not only annoying and time consuming for that person, but also extremely inefficient. So I've always thought that some form of maybe centralized system where in-house counsel could, in their own time, decide what they wanted to write about each lawyer they work with, etc. But there's got to be a better way of streamlining that. We don't want lots and lots of emails and being harassed and also thinking badly about their lawyers as a result. So this is very important. Absolutely. So the submission form is sort of the stage one, phase one, step one sort of thing, baby steps here, right? Because this is going to take a lot of time to affect change. But yes, referees. So there's got to be some sort of standard place where referees go, sign up, give their feedback. And then the legal directories have a special account. They can sign in and see the feedback. And there's got to be some sort of security so it's not fake feedback and all of that. 
But yes, absolutely. And hopefully through the BD Roundtable and lawyers getting on board, we can make this change happen. And if the legal directories aren't going to do it, well, then the law firms will just band together and do it themselves. And then the directories will have no option but to um, fall in line. At least that's my hope. Well, it sounds like it's an opportunity for the BD Roundtable portal. You could almost be the platform to create those referee <laughs> those yeah, references. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I have the tech knowledge to do that by myself, but there are certainly lots of people on the BD Roundtable who could do that, but we'll see. No, I was thinking something like the IBA or some sort of big legal association could help do this. But yeah, no, the legal directory process, I mean, there's a whole cottage industry just for this. So big law firms, like you said, they have the budget to dedicate resources to this. Mid-level firms, they may have one person that they can do in-house for submissions. But what about all the other firms? This is a huge tax on law firms and... It's not sustainable. And what happens is legal directory submissions end up being not very good because law firms are just pumping these out and just sort of copying and pasting. So you're going to get better results when you have a standardized submission form that can be maintained throughout the year. And when a submission comes up, we can just filter out the matters that we don't want to include and just send that off. So yes. This is certainly a big issue that I'm going to be keeping on. And we're going to do lots of roundtable sessions on this to get feedback from law firms. We'll do round sessions with the legal directory to get their feedback and keep at this. Because every one of those dinners that we had from way back in the day in Bangkok always came back to submissions. They're such a pain and they take too much time. So this is one way that I thought I could help the legal industry for this. And so in those dinners, what other topics are particularly discussed? Marketing initiatives, social media, what content do we post? How do we repurpose content? Um, Because legal alerts are notoriously uh, bad. So how can we find new ways to, to get this content out to the business community? And we started talking a lot about lead generation because that's not something you hear a lot about in BD circles and law firms. But just last week, I was talking to a new person out of Singapore and their job title was Director of Business Development and Sales. And this was in a law firm. And I was like, whoa, for them to put the word sales in your job description means that these law firms are getting quite serious about lead generation. So we would always talk about how we can help the lawyers do that. But now I think it's the directors and the marketers who are actually doing some of the lead generation themselves and bringing in revenue for the firm. And then just those dinners were always good just to build the network and the connections and just build the personal connection with people you work with. Yes, that emphasis on sales is something that law firms are looking at the accountancy firms in particular and noticed that they had professional salespeople out there selling on behalf of the accountants and bringing in work. And so many law firms are now looking at hiring these people. And in my former role as head of business development at Dwayne Morris and Selvam, I was also someone who was out in the field and developing work myself, bringing in clients and bridging that gap between the law firms and the clients. But I think at the time I was pretty unique in that. And a lot of that had to do with self-confidence, having been a lawyer, being comfortable talking about law, talking about deals, talking about what we could bring in total. And I think that more business development people within firms that can get that confidence because you don't need to be a lawyer. A lot of them feel like, well, who am I? I'm not a lawyer. I don't have a legal background. I, I can't really do this. But the reality is that if you understand the work, so really do your homework in terms of understanding the kind of work. So understanding what is an acquisition, what is a merger, what other kinds of work, what is derivatives, what is blockchain, 
educating yourself on all these things to a very basic standard, but enough where you're out in the field and you start to hear someone say, well, our business is thinking about buying that business. The bell should ring and you could go, okay, so are you going to be instructing a firm to look at this acquisition for you? Who are your current legal counsel? What are the other considerations? Which country is that in? What's involved? What are the challenges? What are you worried about? And if you're a good listener, it puts you way ahead of the lawyers, because I tell you, one of the main problems is that most lawyers like to talk and they don't like to listen. So as a business development person who is there just to listen, it gives you a great opportunity. Yeah, I'm glad you you said that because a lot of the people I talk to when I talk about lead generation, at least in the community, they say, well, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know all of this sort of stuff. And you don't really need a legal education to understand what the client needs are in a M&A, right? Or even just what a derivative is. Just look it up, right? And when you're pitching for work, like, for example, when I first started in the legal industry, I was preparing a pitch for an M&A and I was asked to gather all the credentials. And I gathered all the credentials for the buyer side, but we were actually working on the seller side of things. But I never even thought about that, right? So one of the things that we're going to be doing in the BD Roundtable is do some legal training for the BD marketers. So we're going to interview lawyers about particular aspects of the law so we can sort of get that legal education or understanding so we can start doing more of the sales work and start understanding how our lawyers actually help the clients and and crafting better proposals so we understand the the issues more deeply. But yes, um, law firms are starting to feel a lot of pressure from the big four and the accountancy firms. And if they don't take any action, then they're just going to get run over. So I think law firms are reluctantly bringing in these sort of sales people, the sales mindset. But I think they'll be better off, obviously, doing that because at the end of the day, they sell a product, right? So they got to be able to know how to sell it. Very good point. So what are you most excited about right now for the future? Well, just continuing with the BD Roundtable. That's my hobby, as it were. But there's a lot going on in the legal industry. I see legal tech changes all across my Twitter feed and LinkedIn feed. So I'm excited to keep learning about how the legal industry is changing. And it sounds a bit cliche, but it really is changing really rapidly. And you almost have to have a dedicated time just to read about all the changes or else you'll just be passed by. So also part of my role is to update our lawyers about those changes too and help them ease into that change. But yeah, so it's exciting time to be in the legal industry, I'd say. What about the current hybrid sort of working? I don't know how Thailand is at the moment. We're still work from home. But what do you think about the future of law firms and what they're going to look like in terms of the office? Because law firms are very traditional and they've all been about bums on seats, sitting in the office. You have to be there. You have to be seen, even though they have a billable hour model. So realistically, you have always been there as a lawyer recording your time. That is evidence of whether you're working or you're not. They don't need to see you. And yet they insist on you being there. So what do you think is going to happen? I think the spaces that law firms use are going to be turned into something a bit different. Maybe, for example, they'll do some more pro bono work with, maybe they'll cut the work space in half. Maybe they'll keep the existing, some of the bigger firms, right? They'll probably remove half of the meeting rooms, turn it into some sort of incubator for legal tech industries or whatever. And they'll move away from that billable hour. But yeah, in terms of the space, it's going to shrink down because it doesn't matter where you work, essentially. It's just the output that matters. And law firms are starting to come to that realization, especially from the BD side of things. So I'm in Thailand and I manage Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar and Vietnam. I'm not there generally. So why do I need to spend time you know, in an office setting in Thailand where most of my you know, effort is for other countries when I can just do it from home? So I save about an hour in commuting time and that hour can be spent on the firm and I get to spend more time with my family, which is better for my mental health, which means I output better products and and deliverables. So yeah, I think the traditional law firm space 
has already changed already. I hear law firms talking about not renewing their leases, going to smaller spaces, but maybe that smaller space is better decorated and has better amenities for events or for those like those pro bono sessions and things like that. So definitely smaller firms, more agile working lawyers are using more, they're used to using Microsoft Teams and sort of these collaboration tools. So certainly a change for the better. Great. Thank you so much for your time. Tell us where people can get in touch with you. Well, on LinkedIn would be the easiest place, Will McLaughlin. You can search for me there. You can also head on over to www.bdroundtable.com and see all the great content we have there. Or search for us on YouTube if you just want to watch a few of the sessions uh, without becoming a member. But again, membership is free. Anyone can join. And uh, we have a private Slack group channel. So if you're new to the legal industry and want to talk to someone with 10 years, 20 years experience and get a response, and that would be the place to do it. Well, it's a fantastic thing that you've created the BD Roundtable. So thank you for all your work on that. I know that the general BD community really appreciates it. And it's a fantastic resource. So thank you for that. And thank you for being on the show today. Well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Legal Genie podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe, rate and review it on Apple Podcasts to help me reach more listeners. If you were a lawyer who is stuck, but you're motivated to try and move forward, why not book a 30-minute no-obligation chemistry session to see if I could be the coach for you? You can book an appointment through my website at laraqassociates.com. The link is in the show notes.